open with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here this morning. We are thankful for the opportunity that we have to study your word together. And we just pray, Lord, that um, as we continue to look at these lines and how they relate to the present time, uh, that we can see our need of you, that we can call upon you, and that we can obey your voice where you lead. Be with each person in their personal struggles. We know there's many difficulties that we face in this world, and we need your help every hour. Help us to call upon you in times of need, as well as um, to be aware of your presence in the things that um, are blessings to us. Give us understanding as we open your word together this morning, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, so, well, how much, so Dwight had brought up uh, that we should finish reading uh, this article in the Signs of the Times um, from August 4th, 1881, before we proceed further. Now, we've, we've read almost all of it um, through the last few days. Um, but he brings up there's in the context here that this is going to be, uh, it was written before James White passed away and published around the time he passed away. What was the date that he passed away? Dwight, do you have that? Was it August 1st, 1881? I'll look it up here very quickly. Okay. Um, well, one thing you see here, it says, the course of Israel after the death of Gideon is thus described by the sacred historian. Are, are, are you suggesting that there's some parallel that Ellen White sees with the time of James White? What I'm, what I'm wondering, given that she gives that uh, James was like Moses to his, to the church, yeah, like Moses was to the children of Israel, mm -hmm. is it possible we may find other similarities and other points that may also support some of this? Well, you would have at least the idea in a line is that um, each line has these similarities, whether you're looking at the death of Gideon or the death of Moses or the death of James White. It's where you have a leader, and once that leader is gone, you have the sort of problems that arise with the death of that leader. Okay. James White was born August 4th of 1821. Okay. James White passed August 6th of 1881. Okay. So he was from, from 1821 to 1881? Yes. So he was 61 years and two days old. He was 60 years and two days old. That's what I meant, 60 years and two days old. Now, so he's in the 61st year. Okay, so in, in a situation like that... Um, in the using the the data we have at hand, how many days was that? Well, it's three hundred and sixty-five and a quarter times uh, sixty plus two. So I guess two sixty-five point two five sixty. So it's uh, twenty-one thousand nine hundred and seventeen days. Okay. I'm just, you know, I'm. Uh, 3,131 weeks. 31, 31 weeks. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay. I find it interesting. I know that, you know, as Elder Jeff had pointed out before, of course, 81 being a symbol of midnight. And James White passed in 1881. Okay. Yeah, which is a mirror. Correct. Yeah. And then he lived for 31 to 31 weeks. <clears throat> and and of course a week is a, is the 31 in the midst of the week is the crucifixion of Christ. And this is doubled, so that's a symbol of midnight. Yeah, so that just just both of those, the 1881 and the 3131, the doublings that we're seeing here, especially pointing toward midnight, is, um, mm -hmm. I think, kind of interesting. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. I mean, we, we haven't really looked at the line of of the first generation, the line of the second generation, the line of the third generation, et cetera. Um, you know, in in trying to to place these on a line, but because there's lots of different lines that exist because you have different way marks and you can zoom into them. You can zoom into 1863 and create a line. You can zoom into, uh, you know, 1888 and create a line. Um, and James White's death would be a way mark in some of those lines. Well, it's also interesting because he was born on a Sabbath and he passed on a Sabbath. Yeah, yeah, that's why the weeks, uh, yep. 31, 31 weeks, exactly. Yeah, so he was born on the Sabbath, passed away on the Sabbath. And uh, I know I've run into that number. Uh, the P1917. I just can't remember where. Um, okay, now as as you were asking the questions yeah. with this. Part of, of what I was looking at yesterday, dealing with, with this with this meeting, and to, to kind of prepare, in taking a look from Scripture, going through Judges 9, in total, but placing some of the, the information that Mrs. White provided may give us some clues as to how we can place all of this on a line. Okay. So, yeah. Using the scripture portion first, Judges 9 1. And okay. Abimelech. Just before we go there, I just wanted to look at this number again. Okay, please. Go ahead. This number of days that James White lived, 21,917. The factorization is 7 times 31. Of course, we know that's uh, 7 times 31 is the symbol for July 27th or July 21st, right? Because 7 times 31 is 217. And then it's also. Um, if you multiply that, you would just take 217, the symbol for midnight, and multiply it by 101. Um, and of course, you can see the different numbers that are produced, uh, the different divisors 731, 101, 217, 707, uh, 3131, and of course, the number itself. Um, so it, it's, it's rather interesting. Um, this, this number that James White slips for this number of days and its connection to the symbols of midnight and to the cross, crucifixion of Christ in the midst of the 70th week. Now, 
in when we're addressing the story of Gideon, remember, we're dealing with the 70th week and particularly the midst of the week, right? We're saying that Jotham rem, um, represents the 70th week, right? Right. So in this context, dealing with James White, I, I think we definitely can compare his death um, as symbolically representational of this period of what ha happens after his death. Okay. And, and so Jotham um, is carrying on a message that comes from, from Gideon, right? Where the other people are rejecting that message, uh, especially Abimelech, who is a descendant of Jotham, but he's not one of the 70, right? He's illegitimate. Okay. So, so that should help us a little bit as well. Okay, so you want to look at the scriptures. We're dealing with this. <clears throat> so Judges 9-1. Right. And Abimelech, the son of Jerubal, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them. And with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying. So here we have the son of a strange woman going to Shechem, which is between the blessings and the curses, mm -hmm. going unto his mother's brethren, his, the, the church that he would choose. Yeah, well, first the mother's father, so that's the maternal grandfather. Okay. Yeah. Because it, it states it secondarily with all of the family of the house of his mother's father. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess more particularly that's the uncles. Okay. Because right? that's who it's going to talk about, his mother's brethren in verse 3. So whether he goes to the mother's the maternal grandfather, I guess it's the descendants of that. Right. And the reason why they're putting it that way. Okay. So Abimelech says, speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, what is good, whether that all the sons of Jerubal, which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. So why is he making the comment to remind them that he is of the same bone and the same flesh? What, what do we see there from, from the way that the Hebrew is presented? Well, I know the bone is the same word used in self-same when it talks about the self-same day. Um, so I don't know what the symbols there particularly mean otherwise. I mean, that's the relation. Now, okay, so just, just another question. So we've said that she, his mother who's a concubine, um, that she's a strange woman, that is, she's a foreigner. So these men of Shechem, um, they would not be Israelites either. Would that be the case? Well, that would, I mean, if we're believing that this is, you know, a foreign woman, then these have to be of a foreign nation. At least partly. And whether that's through um, the mother or the father, like the, or the mother or the grandfather, the grandmother or the grandfather. So, I mean, they could be part Israelites and part foreigner. Because if the, um, 
if the grandfather, because it talks about the mother's father, doesn't talk about the mother's mother, but it could be that the mother's mother is a foreigner. Right. And that the father is actually an Israelite. But isn't this also showing a situation where they had entered into an alliance that they shouldn't have entered? Yeah, well, that's, yeah. So now another point about this. Now in modern Judaism, you actually become a Jew only if your mother is a Jew. Now, do you know why that is? Why no. modern Judaism does that? Um, because in ancient Israel, you were considered a Jew usually through your father, right? Okay. You know, the inheritance came through the father. But it had to do with the influence of a mother on a child's religion because the mother was the one more responsible um, in Judaism for training the child in its youth regarding uh, the religious beliefs. And the influence of having a mother that's not Jewish um, would tell more on the child's uh, religious nature than having, if, if you understand what I mean, that, that they would wander away from God if the mother was not Jewish. So that's why modern Judaism chooses, at least in my understanding of it, why they choose that if your mother's Jewish, you're Jewish. If your father's Jewish and your mother's not Jewish, you're not Jewish. Unless, of course, you convert to Judaism. But, you know, so if you just happen to have a father who happened to be Jewish, um, and he's not religiously a Jew, right? then you're not, you're not considered a Jew. You're not in a Jewish uh, a citizen of Israel. But if your mother is Jewish, even if you didn't know it, because I had a friend who had this happen to him. When his mother died, um, when his father died, I mean, his mother told him that he was Jewish. And she had never told her husband she was Jewish because he was an anti-Semite. He hated the Jews. So, so he didn't know he was Jewish until after his dad died. And um, so, so it is through... Uh, the mother that you become Jew. Plus I have a friend who has, you know, he's descended from Jews, but he's not Jewish. He wouldn't be considered Jewish because um, it was the grandfather that was Jewish. And so you don't get any inheritance in a sense, if just, if it's just through the father. So it's kind of weird in some ways, uh, the difference between what was, what is in the Bible and, and what modern Judaism does. But it had to do, of course, with the fact that marrying these strange wives led Israel astray. Right? Because the women influenced the children in wandering away from God. So, so here in this situation, you have um, this concubine and so I'm assuming that the father is Jewish, but that her mother uh, um, this is the mother's the house of the mother's father, so that the mother um, her mother, the concubine's mother, had married a Jew, but she is not Jew she was not Jewish. Does that make sense? It's interesting. The um, the situation that I that I'm referring back to right now my, for myself, um, it's it's been a little over a year now since the closest friend that I've had in business had passed. Now he was a little bit younger than I. He was Jewish. Yeah. Now, his father was Jewish. His mother was Jewish. Mm -hmm. but he had married a, a gal that was not Jewish. Yeah. And I've seen the effect within the family because none of their children claim to be Jewish. The, the eldest, the one that I know the best 
at one point several years ago ask me for advice and for some teaching as to what it meant to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I found that interesting because this was, this was my friend's eldest daughter, okay. but I never, I didn't find that with the, the younger daughter who, while I know, I don't know well, and I definitely have not seen that with the son. Yeah. And then as far as modern Judaism would be concerned, they're not Jewish. Right. But if the mother was Jewish, right. They would be Jewish. They, they would, they would actually be able to be citizens of Israel. They could go to Israel and be citizens. But if the father's just Jewish, you can't, you're not, you're not considered citizens of Israel. That's my understanding. So I don't know all the conditions that are involved in that, but I do know that that's the case. How, how they determine that, like if the father is Jewish and is religious and the children, I guess, go through bar mitzvah and stuff, then I assume that they would be Jewish too, right? That they, they in a sense, become Jewish. Well, they, 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 would, be rec they would be recognized as such. Yeah. But because yeah. The, the sons would have gone through the bar mitzvah the, the daughters would have gone through the bat mitzvah. Yeah. So. Yeah. But but if even if you don't go through any of that and your mother's Jewish, you are Jewish. Sure. Okay. That's that's what I know. I mean, I'm not an expert on it. I just know Jewish people and I've been told this. So okay. So here we have this situation. We have Abimelech going to the house of his mother's father. He's not reaching out to his father's house. He's reaching out to his mother's father for the approval to become the, the leader, at least in this portion of Israel. So, the symbol, since we have applied Gideon as being a message, yeah. is Abimelech is seeking the approval to become the primary message. Right. And he's seeking sort of an illegit illegitimate source to do so. Yeah, he's, he's seeking from outside the path very much as as we would be able to see with the way that Uriah Smith, W.W. W. Prescott, Leroy Froome, and Desmond Ford had sought to go aside from Miller's rules. Right. Now, and, and so... When we look at the, at this parable later, and I guess because we're reviewing what we did yesterday here, but um, you know, I, I was making an application that you know this could refer to the history of Adventism. This this these these calls for these different trees to be rulers over the trees, and. Um, and the question was whether we apply it to Adventist history or whether we just apply it to our movement. My view is that the movement is referring to, um, uh, I mean, the, the history, the parable is, is in a sense reviewing past history and then bringing us up to the present. That's sort of how I was looking at it. Okay. Um, so you have this progressive destruction of four and then you're in this final generation with with the the bramble right this fourth generation whether that's correct or not we, we haven't decided maybe, i mean maybe that's one application of it um that he can compare this past history of what has happened with the adventist church and then say we're in this same situation and and that's kind of what we are saying already that Really, the movement has has gone the way of the Adventist Church. 
even the ones who have rejected the Adventist church, even the ones who have rejected uh, the false teachings that have come into this movement, like Parminder and so forth, and even the ones that profess to accept July 18th, that in reality, they are no different. And, and it has to do with the fact that they are illegitimate in their claims for authority. Okay. I'm looking at this as if there is some remnant of the message of Parmender that's still pervasive within the movement. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say yes. And see, because Parminder's, and that's why we would look at this, like we can definitely apply it to the movement, but I don't know if we can take four generations and I don't know where we would apply them to the movement if we were to do that. So if we're saying it's four generations, we can apply it to Adventism. But we know that Parminder's movement, the thing that is peculiar about it, you know, the particular nature of what happened is that it actually is much more closely aligned with um, the liberal elements within Adventism. Um, you know, like pretty much they would agree with Spectrum magazine, right? Well, you know, accepting homosexuality and, and, you know, this sort of idea that Ellen White doesn't really apply to us. You know, she was just a writer from the 1800s. And so she believed the things of the 1800s, et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, it, it, that's also kind of the way that, that many are currently approaching scripture. Well, yeah. So there is a, there's, there's two sides of a coin of the same error. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, you know, when we, when we look at the situation that happened with Parminder's movement, and we see this sudden flip, so to speak, if we're talking about coins, from being conservative to being liberal that appeared to just happen. Uh, the thing is, it was really the same premises the same basic thinking um, that that was manifest in both of those uh, types of of um, whether it's liberal or conservative that type of thinking about the Bible, thinking about humanity, thinking about salvation, um, and that that's sometimes hard to discern because on the on the surface they seem quite disparate, right? Right. But people don't change that dramatically. That is, you have bought into some premise, and, and that premise can lead you to two different conclusions, depending upon other factors. You know, an example of this, just to sort of illustrate this, is the nature of Christ. So you would see people like, um, oh, I can't think of the guy's name. In the late 60s, early 70s, um, he was talking about, you know, us getting a new nature. Oh, what's his name? Um, yeah, Brimsmead. 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 Brimsmead, okay. Yeah, so Brimsmead, he believed that Christ had a, um, a sinless nature, right? And that when we're converted, we also get a sinless nature. But, but we also know that the people who uh, rejected the idea of overcoming sin also believed that Jesus had a sinless nature. They both started with the same premise, but they were quite different as far as what they decided about obedience. Brimsmead believed that obedience was, was necessary, perfect obedience, in order to overcome sin and stand in the times of time of trouble. But because he started with the premise that we have, that Jesus had a sinless nature and we have a sinful nature, he taught that our nature actually had to change, that we actually had to get a sinful nature or holy flesh in order to 
keep God's commandments. Right? So one was a very liberal as far as obedience. You know, we can never overcome sin. The other one that we can. But they both had a faulty premise. And Brimsmead ended up flipping the other way and eventually rejecting the Sabbath and, and everything else. So, um, so th that means there is a premise that was held by the people who were first followers of Jeff and then became followers of Parminder that they never let go of. It, it led to two different directions. And because that premise was the main thing driving them. And, and we need to understand what that premise is. We need to understand what, what it is that's driving the problems we see in this movement. Because unless we address, address that point, um, we will just, we'll all end up in the same boat, so to speak, um, as far as apostasy. I mean, I think I know what it is, but, you know, that's just me as a person understanding from my years of experience. And I may not understand it fully, but it's the thing that I've run into in Adventism. And that is the idea or the belief that somehow um, um, we... Well, it, it, it's, I don't even know how to, how to describe it because it, it, it's rather complex. So the first thing that you see about Adventists is Adventists don't want to be recognized as a cult, right? Right. Uh, now, the reason given is that we can't influence people in other churches and so forth if they think we're a cult. So we're going to do everything we can when, when we're talking with someone um, and we're trying to convince them of Adventism. Our, our views change. In that context, we're going to use a different language. You know, we're going to agree with them, even though we don't agree with them, thinking that we're finding common ground when when actually we're, we're standing on completely different islands. Right. At least we should be. You would and, hope. And and so we don't boldly speak out. We don't want to be recognized as as a cult. And so we might downplay how things about our beliefs in order so that people aren't prejudiced against us. And we believe that's being wise as serpent, serpents and harmless as doves, right? Would, would you see that? Any other people's thoughts about Adventism? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but, but there's a deeper problem there, right? So, I mean, sure, that's the excuse is we want to, to witness to others. But really, we're driven by public opinion we're dri dri driven by um reputation um and I'll, um heidi and i've been reading uh uh well uh, nine volume of the testimonies um and uh lots of interesting things in there i mean but this is a particular problem that adventists had or have but in ellen white state they had and so, you know, it is, I don't even know how to put it down as a premise. It, it's, it's, it's just a belief system that Adventists have that makes them, um, one is it makes them impermeable to being corrected. So when it comes to, if you're going to share some things that I've studied, and you share them with an Adventist, they're not going to accept what you say if it's something they've never heard before. They have, they have this great fear of, of being seen as uh, heretics or something like that. And yet Adventists can be very uh, divisive in their own belief system, right? So you can have people who uh, have this sort of strange um, marriage of this idea that we don't want to be seen as a cult but yet within the adventist church we can be very divisive about things that we believe so if somebody doesn't quite believe like you you're going to cut yourself off from them 
right? And we see this manifested in this movement. You know, somebody has a difference of opinion that differs from the group, whatever that group is, they're immediately cut off. So you can see how Adventists can be quite inclusive when they're dealing with non-Adventists, very, you know, very uh, personable, very open, very inviting, very supportive. But as soon as it deals within the church itself, there's this very distinct, if you don't think like I do, there is something wrong with you. Have, have I characterized this problem? Uh, well, I think you've given a, a a good, very basic overview. <laughs> okay. So, so what happened with Parminder's group? I mean, we, we can look at all the theological problems, but it was really one of following the group. And, and that group defined in this very sort of uh, partisan way, right? If you're not for us, you're against us, right? So, so they had this, this sort of party spirit in the sense of a division, divisive spirit. They were all together in their group and very clicky. And we noticed that in 2018 when we were there. Um, and, and part of it was just me uh, trying to correct somebody or give somebody advice, which was to Tamina regarding some of their, their uh, time that they had spent over in uh, Nebraska and the report that they had given. And I gave them some advice and it was not welcome. And, but even before that, we already started to be cut off from, from the group right they were not communicating with us talking with us visiting with us anymore um and and we didn't have the slightest idea really why that was i mean we had some ideas i guess maybe but but even before this incident that was already pretty evident that they were going in a different direction um so so this idea of the group this group identity um but also the fact that somebody isn't going to. So what they did is they followed Parminder, right? I mean, just in the basic sense of it. So that means that the beliefs that we have um, are not well formed. They're not very solid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can see this here. Here you have um, a descendant of Gideon who makes this appeal to uh, the house of his mother's father, this men of Shechem, that's completely, you know, not true. I mean, it's not even good advice. Uh, and yet it's going to be accepted. And it's based upon, I am your bone and your flesh, right? Correct. Okay. So I think this is sort of this, I, I don't know how to, how to, I don't know a word for this sort of thing other than it's, um, you know, how I described it. But I mean, this is a problem I see in Adventism as well that I never really noticed until after I married Heidi is how um, if somebody's raised an Adventist, especially a generational Adventist, they're perceived much differently than, than by the church than somebody who became an Adventist, even if they've been an Adventist for, the long, for a long time, right? Sort of similar to this, this idea of what is a Jew. The idea is what is an Adventist? And, there, and there's some practical reasons for that, which I've talked about before. You know, one is, you know, if you're going to have somebody working in the church and positions of responsibility and somebody has all these family members that have been in the church for generations, they're, they're much more likely to continue in the church than somebody who just uh, became an Adventist a few years ago, right? Correct. Yeah. Yet we do see, search out sea and land to find one proselyte and make him twofold times the child of hell than we ourselves are. That's also true, right? Unfortunately, pretty correct. Yeah. Adventists 
like to get converts to sort of make them feel like, you know, somehow verify their intellectual positions on different doctrines. And they sometimes like to take these proselytes and put them into positions of power. Um, you know, you'll you'll see a new convert, he's very zealous and, you know, they, the church really likes this person and they're going to recommend they go to, you know, some of the Adventist colleges and then they're going to, person might even become a pastor, right? So, so that happens. But these are almost like token members, right? They, they take upon um, a function within the church that really isn't from, it, 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 it doesn't demonstrate a healthiness in the church and it doesn't really benefit that person. And I've seen these people who've been uh, brought in, chewed up and spit out, um, and, and it happens often. Not all of them become pastors, but some just you know become uh, members for a while. But there comes a point in which that novelty of that new member wears out, and they start to be turned on because they, if they don't fit in perfectly with the group, right? So I'm not telling people anything that you've never witnessed yourself, right? I think everyone's witnessed this as a Seventh Day Adventist. And, and I think we could see this being characterized here, this sort of uh, spirit. And, and if we're going to look at what Gideon represents um, and, and his descendants, they represent Adventism in its understanding, not in its role as a social um, uh, a social event, right? As a social group. Would you agree with that? I, see, I've always had a hard time of viewing the church as a social group. I've I've seen it become that more and more over the last 20 years in, mm -hmm. in my view yeah but you're you're raised an adventist to, to no i was not i was not well, not initially right but you became you went through the adventist school system i went i went through the from eighth grade yeah on i went in the adventist school system yeah yeah i was in public school before that yeah yeah so but for the most part, you would, you, you know, you were an Adventist when you became an adult, right? You at least, you know, had been raised an Adventist. I'm just saying it's a little bit different than somebody like me who's never been really a part of the social structure of Adventism, even though, you know, I'm, I'm not a guy who, you know, goes to camp meetings or has family and stuff, you know, that, that are friends that I want to see. I, I'm not a social person, so... Um, even even my own family, I'm not really social towards. So um, I've maybe looked had a different perspective, is all I'm saying, than what you had, right. had. Right. So I would say when I first became an Adventist, that was the thing I noticed right away about Adventists, and that was you know 40 years ago uh, on on Christmas. It'll be 40 years since I was baptized, and I only attended an Adventist church about three weeks before I was baptized. So beginning of December um so so anyway it, it, but it is something we've all witnessed you would agree with that yeah this, this this sort of idea and, and and definitely it's becoming more of that um and I've mentioned this quite a few times but uh, there was an issue that came out in uh, the Adventist Review it was in the mid-90s um I believe, or late 90s. And it was a whole issue about uh, social Adventism. That is, that Adventists, like, and, and there was articles written by different people. Many of them weren't even believing Adventists who still went to church. They didn't really believe in the doctrines, uh, but they liked the social structure of Adventism. And this was seen as a good thing, you know, that we've sort of, 
brainwash people into being Adventists and they're now part of this culture. And even though they don't have a belief in it, they're still going to be vegetarians. They're still going to go to church on Sabbath. And, you know, and the idea that, you know, everywhere you go, uh, church is the same. Uh, they were also, though, in that same uh, issue, uh, belittling the traditional Adventist churches, the ones that, you know, weren't what they called family friendly, um, that where, you know, children had to sit still and and there wasn't coffee to drink and, and uh, you know, there wasn't bright colors like a McDonald's. So they were promoting this idea that churches should be like McDonald's so that children will be attracted to them. And Sabbath schools should be fun and all this crazy kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, so Adventism is much more concerned about you being culturally an Adventist than, than you actually being a truly converted Christian. That's not really the goal of the church. You want, they want you to be con converted to the church and be loyal to the church. But it's not primarily about your relationship with Christ. They give lip service to relationships with Christ, but that's just all a manipulation to make you loyal to the church. I mean, that's the way I see it. I see Adventism as a cult. I don't see much difference between the cult of Parminder or the cult of Adventism. If there is any difference. You know, but but I thought Adventism was a cult from the time I joined it to the present day. I, I don't see that most Adventists are converted, that they are Adventists for bad reasons. Um, that is, they're cultural Adventists. <clears throat> So I, I think that's kind of what we see that if, if we're going to go back to the James White situation, I mean, we already know that the Adventist church was Laodicean, right? By They're that time, all, yeah. Yeah. And, but, but particularly when you get into the 1880s, that message becomes much more predominant with the, in the spirit of prophecy. Correct? So I, I agree. It just the, the interesting portion about this with James White, Mm -hmm. As we were as we were addressing this just at the outset, here's James White, born October or born August fourth of eighteen twenty one. Yeah, he passes on August sixth of eighteen eighty one with one eight eight one. Huh? Two days after this article is published. Correct. Oh, we're we're also looking at 1881 as as a type of a mirror, right? But it's also occurring 18 years after the founding of the church under the laws of the state of of the country of the United States. Okay, so we have. 18 and 81 being tied together so this this was a, a period i think that we could we could point to as midnight right and and, and we can liken it to the death of christ and what happens after with the disciples uh, we can right. like of course to gideon we could liken it to moses um, exactly. but what we have happening here is now the church is without its leader Jeff has retired, right? right. Um, you know, um, so so we have this situation where um, we now have another voice sort of contending for uh, go the attention of God's people to lead them. And and in this history, we definitely see the church taking a stronger role um, and not and, and, and against many of the councils of the spirit of prophecy, by the way. So she obviously believed in organization, which which I believe in, but not the role that organization was seeking to to take. Right. To create a priesthood. 
this and and you know i mean it's changed over time how we look at our our what we used to call them elders so they weren't called i mean you might call them mil ministers but you didn't call them pastor or so and so you'd call them elder um even when i became an adventist um pastors were often referred to as elders um and, and I never grew up with the term pastor in, in the United Church. We always talked about minister, but of course we called them reverend, you know, whatever, which Adventists didn't do. So, so we had adopted some changes in how we, we, we viewed the, the clergy, right? Those that were hired to be ministers compared to the elders that were just the local elders, so the administrative function of the church changed over time. And then uh, the power structure of the church changed over time. And Ellen White was trying to move it away from this centralization to much more uh, local sort of church governance. Right? That the people on the ground doing the work were the ones that needed to be making the decisions and the role of the church was to support them in doing the work of spreading the gospel isn't that more in in keeping with the way that that the early church was operating yeah yeah but but you know the church ha has i mean like like all things i mean it became becomes a bureaucracy the larger the institution becomes but it doesn't even have to become large to do that i mean you know, when we talked about like the school of the prophets and how it was being operated, I mean, it was being operated from the top down. And, you know, in my understanding of things, if, and and because I've been in the self-supporting work, decisions were never made top down in the self-supporting work that I was a part of. That is, decisions were made primarily by consensus. That is, the people who are doing the work would always be consulted in any decision that affected them. They always had a voice. You wouldn't just have all of a sudden a rule being enforced that you never had a part in making. And, and that was a problem at the School of the Prophets in Arkansas was there was all of a sudden new rules all the time that you had no reason why they existed and they were nonsensical. They didn't seem to have a purpose other than to make people miserable. I mean, one of the reasons that Parminder was able to get so many people to follow him and be opposed to um, Bronwyn is Bronwyn was a tyrant, you know, sadly, right? I mean, she, she made life miserable for people and people walked on eggshells when she was around. Um, so she wasn't really a true leader didn't know how to be she wasn't she didn't have the experience to be a leader and yet we were supposed to do what she said even though the rules seemed arbitrary it seemed like policy not principle no principles were being followed that followed that we could understand and that's not how you do things that's not how you run an institution it's not how you run a local church because if you don't get consensus you don't get any support people won't do things if they don't feel like they're a part of things, that things are just being imposed upon them. And, and if we look at how God operates, isn't that how God operates? He doesn't operate as a tyrant. He operates as a friend. Right. He's there to help us, to identify with us, to participate with us christ didn't just stay in heaven he came to this earth and took upon himself our nature and suffered he didn't just direct from his great throne in heaven and and of course we see why we need the son and not just the father right we need this one who is acting as a servant who's revealing actually the character of the father right Christ's character is not different from his father's character. So here we have this problem in 
in what Abimelech is doing. It's no different than what Satan was doing in heaven. Because from what we see, the 70 sons of Gideon have the same attitude and spirit as Gideon had. They are not ruling over God's people. But the one who falsely accuses them of seeking to do this is going to do it himself. And it just like Satan, it's it's envy, right? And pride. Especially the pride. Yeah. And and that's the thing about this movement is we're no different in the church. We're no different than these people in the, you know, who are, we're no different than Abimelech. And we're no different than Satan. We're the accuser of the brethren. And so we have to, we have to understand that. Or else we're going to go down this same course that we see here uh, illustrated in the story of Abimelech. And that we see happen after, after the death of James White. Mm -hmm. Had that guidance removed from the church. I mean, do you think that the church could have tre treated Ellen White the way they did um, uh, if James White had continued to live? Would she have been banished to Australia? No. No, right? And, and in, in a sense, you can say that, that Ellen White is typified here by Jotham standing upon the Mount of Blessing and, and giving a parable, telling them, repeating their history to them and warning them of the direction that they're going and the decisions that they're making where they actually lead. And that's true also of our time. The spirit of prophecy is there to warn us and to, to guide us. And we, we constantly ignore her, her words. We pick and choose what we want when it comes to condemning others, uh, but we're never seeking ourselves to be corrected. That's kind of the, the issue that, as I have read this through, that those of Shechem were wanting and desiring to be led. They didn't mm -hmm. want to take the personal responsibility. They wanted somebody else to be the responsible party. Yes. Now, when, when, when it comes to then this, this parable of, of Jotham, right? So if we go to verse 7. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood upon the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. Now notice, he goes to Gerizim. Could he as easily have gone to Mount Ebal? He could have, yes. But he's going to be upon the Mount of Blessing, not upon the Mount of Cursing. Is that purposeful? Well, given, you know, given here that after the slaughter of his brothers, that the men of Shechem have gathered together at the, you know, the gathering house, the Senate. Yeah. As they would say it for that area. And they mm -hmm. made Abimelech king By the plain of the pillar or the oak of the pillar that was in Shechem. Oak. Yeah. So, so translated as plain doesn't really make much sense because it is just the word that means oak, rather strong tree. And, so and yeah. So we're dealing with this oak where Jacob rid his household of idols. Yeah. We're dealing with this oak where Joshua made a covenant. Right. 
and set them a statute and an ordinance. Mm -hmm. Now, is Abimelech relying on the symbols of Jacob and Joshua to validate his decision to try to become the leader? Yes. I mean, that, that's pretty evident that that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to become a legitimate king, even though he has no qualifications to be a legitimate king. One is they're not supposed to be a king. They're supposed to, God's their king. And, and, and the 70 sons of Gideon are not going to be ruling over Israel. Okay, so the, the, the point here is Abimelech, since there was not supposed to be a king, but he is seeking to be a king, mm -hmm. is he not in this in this manner of, of looking at this, in this, you know, that this is a message, is he not trying to replace the word of God? Yes. And He's replacing the word of God and he's replacing the prophecy that was given, right? I mean, Jotham is going to be standing in opposition. That is the 70th week in opposition to this message. Is he replacing the prophecy or is he trying to remove the prophetic understanding? Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? So he's, he has a prophetic understanding that he's promoting, that's being promoted. There's a message that's being promoted that has the trappings of being the true message. But it's illegitimate because it has rejected the light that has come from Gideon. Okay. Now, the issue that we've got with this mm -hmm. is that he doesn't just have his the the house of his mother's father behind him he now mm -hmm. has all of shechem behind him yeah now the entirety of that of that town legitimate and illegitimate have now made the choice that Abimelech should rule over them. Right. So now here is the, I mean, the, the next portion from the spirit of prophecy. And then, yes, I want to jump directly into this with what we're seeing in, in nine, seven. Okay. So the next portion is from uh, paragraph nine forward. Okay. Abimelech was successful in his schemes and was accepted at first by the Shechemites and afterward by the people generally as the ruler of Israel. But while thus exalted to the highest position in the gift of the nation, he was utterly unworthy of the trust. His birth was ignoble, his character vicious. The higher and nobler qualities, virtue, integrity, and truth, he had never cherished. He possessed a strong will, an indomitable perseverance, and thus, by the most unscrupulous measures, he accomplished his purpose. Now, as a, as a case in point, interrelating this to you know, some of the things that we're seeing occurring now after this recent election, for the next six weeks, we're going to have what's considered a lame duck Congress. Yet, the situation, if, if this holds, there will be a different House of Representatives than had been before. Okay. Yeah, so from the election to, you're talking about December 6th? I'm talking that if, if everything holds the way it's going right now, yeah. that this 
you, you were going to see roughly about six weeks remaining of this December 6th committee that's been trying to find reasons to eviscerate Trump. January, January 6th committee you're talking the Jan about. January 6th committee, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Okay. My fault. And and then well, December sixth we have the 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 runoff election for for Georgia. Right. So that's five weeks after the initial election. But we're no longer going to have after after January, we're no longer going to have Nancy Pelosi as the Speaker of the House. Yeah. If this holds. Yeah. Well, okay, so exactly what happens, because uh, um, is there going to be a, a split house, like 50-50 with the two nope. independents? Or, what are you saying? The way, the way that it's looking right now is that the Republicans will take control of the House with a very slim majority. I don't see how that's possible from what I saw. Because the Democrats have 50. That's the Senate. Oh, that's the Senate. Oh, yeah. Okay, you're right. Yeah, so, okay, I'm getting, yeah, you're right. So, yeah, the House, okay. So the House, you're going to have, yeah, the Republicans will have a slight control of the House, so they will get the, uh, they will get to place the Speaker of the House. Correct. Okay. Yeah, because they have 218 right now, the Democrats 210, and, and, that's all they need to have control. And the, situ the situation is the purse, the money gets appropriated through the House. Okay, so the Senate doesn't have anything to do with that. They just no. have to do with approval of legislation. The, the difficulty in the Senate right now, you know, the Senate would be the one to approve anyone that had to go on the Supreme Court. Okay. But in the House, it's the House that approves the funding. Okay. Now, but, uh, so the Senate, what do they discuss? So when you have legislation, doesn't it, it secondarily go through the Senate? Yes. So that would be the legal part of things. So laws are proposed by Congress and then approved by the Senate. And then the president has veto power. Correct. That's what I understand. Okay. And and so yeah, in the Senate, you're you're not gonna have a majority for anyone, but you will have the Republicans controlling the Congress. You you'll have you'll have the Republicans controlling the House. We will continue to have what looks to be a divided Senate with Kamala Harris being the tipping vote. If there's if there's a 50 50 time. So my point in looking at this. We have higher and nobler qualities that were supposed to be seen by those leading. We have not seen those higher and nobler qualities over the last two years. Yeah. So just getting back to the. So with this government, the way that it's set up for the next two years, um, you're, you're basically going to have an impotent government for to a large degree, except that the president will be able to do all these sort of things that presidents do that they really well, to do. <laughs> what would what would happen is he could attempt to govern with executive orders. Right. Yeah, that's the exact. That's what I'm talking about. But the, the exec the the executive order situation is tenuous at best because if it is legally challenged, it can be overturned. Right, and also when it comes to the money that would be need to be done, used or spent, that would be Congress that would be addressing that point. The House, yes. Yeah, or the House. So Congress refers to the House and the Senate. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All I know is the opposite opposite of progress is Congress. But anyway. Exactly. Yeah. It's so, always been that way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. so yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Just can't go on. 
okay, the situation that I looked at, this is a very, it's a tacit approach of another victory for Trump. Um, because, because the January 6th committee will not likely exist right. in the next year. Right. And then, and, and that's why Trump, I think, is running, well, he put in his uh, bid to, for, to be run in uh, his announcement. His announcement, I guess, is what you would call it. I don't know how, how it works in American politics. Um, in Canada, you can't actually even announce that you're running for something until uh, the election is called. But um, anyway, there's... Brother Dwight. Yes. To, um, them executive orders, ain't they got to be approved by Congress before they can... Um, for they, before they become law. Technically. That's but, what I thought. I didn't I, I wasn't for sure. I thought that you could they had to go through Congress in order to be approved by law. Yeah, well, the, if, if money if money is involved. Well, no, technically all executive orders are to be approved through Congress. The the president is not supposed to make the law. Congress is to make the law. The president is to enforce the law. Veto it or, or enforce it. Right. And then okay. the Supreme Court is to interpret the laws. Yeah. So these executive orders, they started um, when? Uh, if, if you went back, uh, you probably could show selected executive orders back with Roosevelt. Okay, so re fairly recently. Yeah. Yeah. And and some of these would be first done in connection with just immediacy of a need that it would take time to go through all these other processes, right? Right. So I'm mean, gonna, I'm going to give you an example if if the president declares a war on another nation, they he has to go to the Congress and they had to sign off on it before he could go to war. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. But part, partly this always had to do with the money that was required as well. Because the president doesn't have uh, the strings to the purse. Well, it, it okay, if, if, if you want a direct example, mm -hmm. the Iran-Contra affair that was such an issue during the Reagan administration mm -hmm. was because Reagan subverted the procedure that he was to follow in providing weapons because he, he wanted to get weapons into Iran's hands, but he didn't want to have to make it widely known as to what he was doing. So right. he was trying to go around Congress and around others to make sure that what he thought was right was done. Yeah, and that sometimes, well, you know, all this stuff is so public, uh, what's being discussed in, in the House and the Senate. Um, then you know, when it comes to these sort of delicate situations, they need to be done. I mean, I know that they can have secret meetings. Um, correct? They can have right. secret, secret meetings, so they could have done it secretly. And they can have committees and so forth that can meet in secret. But Reagan just kind of acted on his own. Unilaterally. Yeah. Okay. So... It's going to be it's going to be interesting because this with the the makeup of the Senate, I'm not saying that that or excuse me, the makeup of the House. I'm not saying that these are any more virtuous, have any more integrity or are going to be any more truthful than those that have been there for the last couple of years. But this is going to, by and large, end what was going on with this January 6th committee, if this holds. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so, yeah. And that's going to put an end to, of course, uh, some of the barriers that they were trying to set up to get Trump to run as president in 2024. Well, can, can, I, can I ask you, what's the, I know I probably should know this, but what is January 6th committee about? January 6th committee was trying to implicate President Trump as being a seditionist oh, okay. for objecting to the way in which the 2020 election turned out. Okay. Yeah. All right. So in other words, they're trying to blame him for that incident. Yes. That took place. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, um, so a number of things. So one is, you know, we know what's happened in um, Arizona as far as uh, um, I can't remember the people's names, but the person who ended up winning is not really very popular. Katie Hobbs. Yeah, and and also uh, still had the role of overseeing the election process. So she didn't recuse herself from that responsibility, which appears to be a conflict of interest, at least in some people's opinions, whether I understand fully the role that she actually had, whether it's actual or symbolic or whatever. Um, and, and also the irregularities regarding the machines that didn't work in Mariposa County. Mariposa or Maricopa? Maricopa, whatever it is. It's Mara something. Okay. <laughs> Whatever the county was. Yeah, it's Maricopa, not Mariposa, because Mariposa is in Florida, right? Right. Yeah, Maricopa County. And um, and then, so so there's, you know, going to be protests and so forth and all this type of stuff going on. So we still have all of this agitation in the United States. Um, Unfortunately, this agitation is going to continue. Right. And and the it's it's a heightening of the civil war that exists in the US. We are not far from a far or a, a full outbreak of a civil war. Which which is really what I think is is the most likely scenario that we're gonna see. Um but, I don't think nobody that. wants I'm sorry, nobody wants it though. If you have a full scale war in the United States it's going to be a bloody mess. Yes, it is. Yeah. But, because but I, everybody I, in the United States owns a gun. And, and if almost. They, almost everybody. I don't own one, but I'm just saying everybody in the United States, especially the hunters, own, a, own guns. And like Jeff said years ago, if you, if you take one state, one state is almost like a standing army. Yeah. In some places. One of the one of the things that that has been a deterrent from others attacking this country is the fact that the citizens of the United States are the best armed non militia that you will ever find. Mm -hmm. Now in in my situation as I grew up, I had a friend that loved to go shooting his guns, and I would go with him from time to time. I don't, I choose not to own a gun. I have other friends that own multiple guns. I've had times, even at church, where there would be people that would, would come to the church that would not exactly be completely welcomed by, by certain people. I remember one time that there was a man that came into the church and all he wanted to do was to get from that church to a Catholic church in that area. And he, he told me exactly what Catholic church it was. I just shrugged my shoulders and said, fine, I'll give you a ride. I had a friend that came up to me before I left and he said, do you feel safe? And I said, I'm fine. And he said, well, look, I've got a gun. Take it with you. And I just looked at him and I said, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not in need of this. 
Now, our situation right now is we know what Mrs. White has stated, that there would be another civil war in this country. She went through in her life the bloodiest war this country had ever seen because it was brother against brother. But it was also against those that within 70 years of the, actually within 90 years of the original war against Great Britain, we still had a lot of people that were well-trained in the use of arms. Now, our situation right now is we've had a very divided nation. This division is not going to heal. No, it's going to get worse. And as and, it... And with Trump running, with Trump running um, I mean, I mean, this is going to increase this uh, conflict. Yes. Uh, and Trump's not going to win. And does that's he, a lot does of he have to win? Hmm? Does he does have he, to win? Does he have to win? No. I mean, what do you mean? In, in his mind? No, in the, in the overall picture, I mean, at this at this oh. point, we have we have a very aged, mentally deficient person that is occupying the White House. Yeah, who won't be running against Trump? I don't I don't know that that man has the fortitude, the strength to make it through this next year. Right. I mean, I think he's going to retire fairly soon. Well, there, there was a, there was an article and I looked, I looked at this and I had to shake my head, but I, I could have to admit that it was plausible that right now, the best defense for the current occupant of the white house is his vice president because no one wants to see her involved in the day-to-day -day operation of the country. Yeah. There was a group that actually pointed out that if she was to be removed, that it could be that they would then bring in someone else that sees as himself a more vibrant leader now, how can, how does talking, it, I'm sorry, you ain't talking about that guy in California. Or... That was the way the article was written. Yeah. Um, what I don't understand is in American politics. So so they elect uh, a president and a vice president. Correct. Um, can that vice president be removed or would they have to? Yes. Uh, do you remember a man by the name of Richard Milhouse Nixon? Well, yeah. Okay. Nixon had a vice president whose name was Spiro Agnew. Yeah, I've heard the name. I don't know much about him. Okay, Agnew was removed as vice president. And Nelson Rockefeller became vice president because he was selected as such. Okay, so he wasn't, he wasn't voted in or anything. Or excuse, excuse me, it wasn't Rockefeller. It was because um, Rockefeller was the one that followed Ford. So it was uh, Gerald Ford. Okay, Gerald. Okay, that I, makes my fault. That that's yeah. That that would fit with what I remember. So, but, so he, uh, why, why did they why did they remove him? Um, basically, they caught him. He had been the governor of Maryland, and I believe that they were able to prove that he had taken bribes. Oh, okay. Well, you can count all of them up there now doing that. Pretty much. So they so all they would need to do to remove uh, Kamala Harris would be uh, um, just to, to just bring up something true about her. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, okay. 
Now, she gets removed. I mean, does she does she have a political future? No, she does not. Yeah. At this point, she gets removed. The article that I that I had observed that I'd read was commenting how Gavin Newsom, current governor of California, could then replace her. Gavin Newsom is Nancy Pelosi's nephew. So all of a sudden you get someone that is quite a bit younger, that is seen to be quote unquote vibrant, but however is much worse than the current occupant of the White House. Mm -hmm. Now, directly, uh, what may be seen as a favor to California would be a disaster to the country. Mm -hmm. Now, can the vice president be removed? Yes. Can that then affect the, the secession into the White House? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because... If something happens to the president, the vice president becomes the next in line. Yeah. The next in line after the vice president becomes the speaker of the house. And, yeah. and let's hope all this happens after, after January. Correct. <clears throat> now. Well, I ain't going to hope it anyway. I know we're, we're disobeying our world to start with, but. So that's January. What what's the date for that? That these changes occur? Is it January twentieth? No, that's just for the presidential okay. inauguration. If I'm not mistaken, this would take place, I believe, January second. Okay. I'd have I'd have to go back and look, but I think that's correct. Okay. Now, the reason that that we're addressing all of this the way it, that we are hinges on this next paragraph from this in signs of the times. Yeah. The Israelites blinded by their own sinful course of apostasy were acting directly contrary to God's express commands. And he left them to reap the result of their own folly. It was not God's will that Israel should have a king, but in the, in case they desired to be thus governed, the Lord, understanding the pride and perversity of the human heart, had reserved to himself the right to appoint a king over them. God had brought Israel out from Egypt to be a peculiar people, especially devoted to himself, and unlike any other people. Israel's great ambition to imitate the idolatrous nations around them was the result of separation from God. Now, if we read this carefully, mm -hmm. we can apply this to the church and we can apply this to the movement. Yeah. Our situations at this point, especially with what we have been seeing occurring within the movement, are not according to God's order. Mm -hmm. No, and we have God's order clearly laid out for us. Right. How, how we are to act and how we are to approach studying and how do we, we are to approach differences. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we have to be able to, to recognize this if we're going to accomplish the task that God has given us. Right. Otherwise, we would just go to the way of the church. Exactly. And we will be passed by. So. so we're going to have this thought for our consideration today and our consideration tomorrow. When we return to this study on Sunday, we're going to go further into this situation regarding Abimelech. And I think... By going through these paragraphs, we should have enough information, enough basic way marks, so that we would be able to begin putting this portion to a line. Okay.
Okay, well, we probably should then close. Okay. Okay, well, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the study this morning. Please um, be with us throughout this day. Thank you for the things you teach us. We pray for this movement. We pray for our individual selves that you can help us to see our need of you, to confess our sins, and to be humbled. Help us to trust in you in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.